I was staggered. Uh, I never expected it. It was it was an incredible honor and one that I'm deeply grateful for. Uh, but I had certainly never thought that such a thing would uh, uh, be available to me, and I I took the uh, the opportunity very seriously. I, I wrote for six years. Uh, the manuscript languished for about four years in the editing process, so a total of ten years involved in the production of the book, and it was it was certainly my magnum opus. The project was simply dropped in my lap. I never considered writing about the mid-20th century court. In fact, I'd never written much on the 20th century at all. I'm a, I started out, at least, a Reconstruction historian and then moved backward in time into the um, late 18th century. And I'd always thought that writing 20th century history would be simply impossible because of the volumes of primary sources available. I didn't know how anyone could ever work their way through the masses of material that you need to do to work responsibly in the 20th century. So I never even considered working in the 20th century. Um, but as I say, the project dropped in my lap, and this was the uh, golden opportunity that I would have been insane to refuse. Um, so I gulped, swallowed hard, <laughs> and said, OK, I'll do it. Then, the so you asked about the preconceptions. I didn't have any personally, but there was a widespread perception out there that the courts between um, the death of what I call classical legal thought around 1938 and the advent of the Warren Court in 1954 was a, a period in which very little of any interest or significance happened, that the court was uh, rudderless, or at least without a helmsman, as it drifted around buffeted by the personal antagonisms among Felix Frankfurter, William Douglas, Hugo Black, and Robert Jackson, mm -hmm. that the Truman appointees were all of them mediocre, and that the court was unable to accomplish very much um, in the way of uh, significant constitutional decisions. That's sort of the general wrap. I didn't share it, but that is the the <clears throat> historiographic heritage and that I moved into. What can be said about the court in this period? What is there significant to say about the uh, court from 1941 to 1953? Because I intuited that the general reputation is, is inadequate, wrong, but I wasn't sure why or where I would go with the idea that with that sense that there's something wrong here. So I figured, well, the way I'll start answering this question I posed to myself is to survey the state of constitutional law after 1937-1938, where, because obviously the, the court that <clears throat> Stone took over in 1941, when he moved to the center seat, was um, operating in a new era of constitutional law, where a structure of law that had pre-existed <clears throat> for a half century was no longer available. The court would have to rethink a lot of um, its premises <clears throat> about uh, public law. Well, what happened was, <clears throat> the, where the story is going is that I ended up inadvertently writing a book about that subject. Before I wrote the Holmes mm -hmm. Devised book, I started writing chapter one, which was to be an introduction to the state of public law in 1941, and that, that in fact, became the first chapter in, in the Holmes Devised book. But the more I wrote that first chapter, the more important issues came up that I didn't think that people had addressed adequately or that I thought needed elaboration or application. And so I started writing, and the chapter began replicating uh, ideas all over the place. <clears throat> and um, I soon found that myself sitting on top of a mass of writings about the development of constitutional law before 1941. Um, and I didn't know what to do with it. I, I, it was too mu way much too, too much for a chapter. And yet I couldn't not publish it because it was the essential background to <clears throat> the book itself. I really had to write the book, the introductory book, to get to the book. Historians call that a prolegomenon, and I, I had um, was sitting on this manuscript material. Well, by chance, I was invited to 
<clears throat> addressed the American Society for Legal History to be the keynote speaker at, in uh, 1995, I think it was. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll take this manuscript and talk about its general ideas. And the opportunity of doing that made me realize, after I spoke and responded to questions, that I had actually written a book, which mm -hmm. had not really occurred to me before. And um, that book became the, was published around 19... 98, I think, The Lost World of Classical Legal Thought, Oxford University Press. There you go, good. <laughs> um, Ryan Lamb would be proud. <laughs> I realized that the challenge of the Stone Court and then the Vincent Court six years later was to fashion a body of legal thinking or a way of thinking about law that classical legal thought had supplied, but that it had come to a sudden and catastrophic end in 1937-38. Um, the court had to salvage judicial review out of the wreckage of the Lochner era precedents that are now were systematically being discarded. Assuming that it was going to continue the project of judicial review, but it had to come up with a new reason or rationale for the judicial review, which means for the place of courts in American society, what justifies the power of judges. Um, and I came up with what is really a cent the, the central thesis of the Holmes devised book, which is that the court failed to come up with a replacement for classical legal thought. And I don't think that that is that much of a condemnation of the Stone and Vincent courts because <clears throat> we still haven't come up with a replacement mm -hmm. for classical thought. I'm not endorsing classical thought. I think it was fundamentally wrong. It did provide all of us, lawyers, judges, lay people, with a structured way of thinking about law that answered a lot of big questions about the place of law in American society. And once we discarded that, that way of thinking, mm -hmm. we have been really bereft of um, a shared discourse and assumptions about law and the way that law works. So what my, my, my Holmes device book ended up being was an exploration of how the judges attempted to come to terms with that vacuum, how they tried to fill it, um, and how they failed to succeed in doing so. Felix Frankfurter, William Douglas, Hugo Black, Robert Jackson, and to a surprisingly lesser extent, Harlan Fisk Stone would, um, would dominate the wartime court. And um, it, it's interesting to speculate what it might have been like had their personal relations and their intellectual compatibility been more harmonious, mm -hmm. but that certainly was not the case. Neither at the intellectual nor the personal level did those four or five get along. Um, Someone, a, a journalist of the era, I believe it was, uh, described the court at that time as nine scorpions in a bottle. Um, it would have been more correct to say four scorpions in a bottle. Uh, poisonous animosity among the four um, evolved quickly within two years. By 1943, it was firmly in place, uh, and it only after that was only cultivated or deepened by the principles. How did the other five sort of observe and react to that? Do you ever get a sense of their writings as they were watching the interplay among the four? I, I, know, I, I think they, my sense is that they were largely aloof in their own individual ways. Stanley Reed, for example, appears on the basis of when you, when you read the uh, Reed and Frankfurter papers at Kentucky in the Library of Congress, you get the sense that Stanley Reed was, for his, was Felix Frankfurter's punching bag that um, Frankfurter seems to have mercilessly abused him in conference, in conversation. He, he had an extremely low estimate of Reed's capabilities and abilities. Um, so Reed was, in a sense, the kind of the, the perpetual victim or fall guy for, for Frankfurter. Um, at best, the straight man. Uh, Murphy was also abused even more than Reed was by Frankfurter. Um, Murphy was a little more sensitive about that than Reed was. Um, and he, almost pathetically, always hoped to live up to Frankfurter's, uh, what he thought to be Frankfurter's standards and 
uh, Frankfurter reminded him frequently that he did not and never would. Rutledge was an individual of great integrity, much like Burton, two, two men on the court with, I think, the highest integrity quotient, in the sense that they, they knew their own mind, they understood their own principles, they followed both of them uh, honorably, uh, both were admirable judges. And by and large, the, the other five members of this Greek chorus were not commenting on the mm -hmm. behaviors of the, of the four principles. Did he and Frankfurt naturally gravitate toward each other? Never really. They never worked in tandem as people thought that Black and Douglas did. Actually, they, there was much less cooperation between Black and Douglas than outsiders assumed. Uh, but there was, even, was not even that degree of cooperation between Jackson and Frankfurt. They simply agreed on uh, one fundamental point, which is, is that the lesson to be learned from the bad experience with Lochner jurisprudence is, is that judges ought to be deferential to legislative choice. Um, but so they would often come out at um, and similar positions on judicial deference or hostility to judicial activism. And that led people to think that they were much closer in uh, personally and intellectually than in fact they really were. Each deeply respected the other. I suspect that it would be a fair guess that um, each was the, the individual on the court that the other most respected. Their respect ran deep were also capable uh, of um, severe and sharp disagreement. And the most spectacular disagreement between them uh, was West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, the second flag salute case, where Jackson simply shredded Frankfurter's Minersville versus Gobitis opinion um, to the point of making it almost ad hominem. He, I mean, he, he took Frankfurter's basic premises and and uh, essentially put him through a wood chipper, mm -hmm. and there was just nothing left of of what Frankfurter looked back with fondness and pride on as a as a definitive statement of his judicial opinion. I think I can explain Black's behavior and the whole thing a lot better. Um, but let me talk about their individual personalities and then how these two personalities interacted in that in that sad event. Um, Black was uh, I, one of the keys to understanding Hugo, Hugo Black's character and his achievements on the court. Is that you've got to remember that this guy was completely an autodidact. Everything that he learned, he learned by teaching himself, by a, a program of reading in the classics of the Western canon. Um, he had virtually no undergraduate education. One year, or was it two years at law school, in a law school that at that time had um, exactly two faculty members. Jackson had some similarities to Black in that respect. He too had a what could best be called a deficient education. Um, both came to the court with essentially little law school, to put it kindly. Um, Black was, uh, correction, uh, Jackson was not the erudite autodidact that Black was, but somewhere, I have no idea where, this is for his next biographer to figure out, somewhere Jackson developed a facility with the English language that we have not seen in an American public figure since Abraham Lincoln. I, an ability to think write and, sp well, think and write in, in English prose that is absolutely unmatched. Mm -hmm. I, and the, the strongest sense I have of, of Jackson as a jurist is the, um, the power of his prose, how, how brilliantly he wrote. Um, <clears throat> I think there are, are um, 330,000 words in that book. <clears throat> I wish that just a tiny fraction of them could have been written with the sparkle and the verve and the force that Jackson wrote. And it's, you know, it's significant that we still quote him today mm -hmm. for his aphorisms. Now, what does that have to do with Black, Jack and Jackson and Black and the feud? 
Um, not much, because as I say, I can't explain Jackson's behavior. Black's behavior, on the other hand, is, is a little more accessible. Black was um, a southern gentleman of, of enormous reserve. Uh, he didn't, did not come from a wealthy family by any means, but he had the, the courtly virtues that southern, southern males of his time uh, claimed to have had, and, and he reacted to Jackson's attacks with a kind of an aloof dignity and silence, and he never um, responded in any way at all. Whereas and Jackson in the, in the conflict was extremely volatile uh, emotionally and um, indiscreet, to say the least, about uh, how he spread his opinions about. Um, and black remained um, silent and stoic and invulnerable to the attacks. Mm -hmm. I think as a matter of the internal dynamics of the court, the black Jackson feud blew over pretty quickly as far as everyone else was concerned. They, uh, the, you know, the current cliche is let's put this behind us and move on. Well, I think the Supreme Court did a great job of putting it behind them and moving on. I, I did everything that I could really in the book that would remain within the bounds of plausibility to rehabilitate the reputation of Fred Vinson, whom I think was a much better jurist than his reputation allows, which is not saying very much at all because his reputation is so low, it, you know. Um, you, can, you can boost his reputation by 30% and still <laughs> not have gotten very far just because you start so low. But the one critical thing I might have to say about Vinson, having, I emphasize I've tried to speak positively of him in the book, because he did have many virtues. The one f critical uh, comment that might be fairly um, directed at him is that he failed completely to mediate the uh, tensions and the conflicts and the rivalries that uh, affected his court for seven years. That part of the stereotyped image of, um, uh, of Vincent, I think, is valid. That he was not an effective leader of the court. So he could rely neither on the force of intellect, as Stone could, to some extent, or on a bonhomie uh, to unite the court. And Vincent reserved his bonhomie for the Friday night poker games with Truman aboard the, the yacht. That letter is really important. It is, the, you're correct in saying it's the only appendix I have in the book. And uh, I'm glad it has that particular prominence because it's sort of my personal indirect and muted tribute to Robert Jackson. I, I presented it there as a specimen of a truly deeply principled individual wrestling with his thinking on a, on a subject that <clears throat> I don't think he ever really satisfactorily resolved before his death. Um, <clears throat> the reason I disagree with your characterization is that I think that, <clears throat> I don't think that Jackson was really looking for an opinion from Fairman. I think that he was, he was saying in effect, <clears throat> I would be glad to have the benefits of your thoughts on this matter. I'd like to see how you think about it. But what I think that letter, primary, that and one companion letter that I did not uh, append there where Jackson did the same thing also to Fairman. I think in those two letters to Fairman, what Jackson was really trying to do <clears throat> was to use Fairman as a sounding board so that Jackson could lay out his own thinking mm -hmm. and to put on paper the, the dilemmas that he confronted, uh, parallel to Frankfurter's thinking here, uh, except that Frankfurter was more active in trying to resolve his, his difficulties. Uh, as I say, Jackson wrestled with it inconclusively. He put that letter there as an appendix because it, it, it really he speaks Jackson's fundamental integrity so effectively. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that everyone who reads any part of the book reads that letter because it, it, um, uh, it, it really, it, it completely gives the lie to Rehnquist's preposterous mm -hmm. hearing testimony about Jackson's position in the case. And it, it illustrates, whatever you may think of Jackson or the outcome of that case, it illustrates a man of, <clears throat> who had his own definite moral compass and a powerful mind at the same time working on a, on a problem of 
of really deep significance, and it's, it's uh, an impressive document to read. Something more than rumor, I think it's better substantiated than a rumor, is that much of that book was ghostwritten by Paul Freund at the Harvard Law School. Um, Freund was my constitutional law teacher, not that I was close to him, although I do revere him as one of my mentors, but we were in no way close. Um, and there's a lot in, the, in that book, The Struggle for Judicial Supremacy, that does reflect Freund's thinking, but I think it was entirely Jackson's book and reflected Jackson's thought, the mm -hmm. lessons that he drew, <clears throat> the uh, sense that he had of the inherent limitations on judicial power and the dangers of judicial activism, uh, thinking that paralleled Frankfurters but did not replica duplicate it. It didn't surprise me because um, <clears throat> I came to that opinion first in Freund's constitutional law class in 1961-62, and by that time, um, <clears throat> Jackson's opinion had taken its place as the, uh, not only the best opinion of the, how many were there, four, six opinions in that case, mm -hmm. but um, the, the one that was going to uh, have the greatest staying power in terms of its influence on the way that we think about constitutional issues. You know, that's funny that you should ask. I have never really thought about the question, so this is de novo for me right now. Um, I'll back into this one. My, my heroes on the subsequent courts are Brennan and Harlan. Uh, Harlan because the second Harlan. He's a, he is to me the, the epitome of a principled conservative and I re recur to his thinking frequently for, truly for enlightenment. Um, uh, I, I'm just amazed at the riches of his thought. Uh, for Brennan, um, Brennan to me represents the liberal ideal at its very best. Um, there's, there was nobody like that on the court that I wrote about, but if anyone came close, it probably would have been Jackson. Mm -hmm. Douglas was definitely not my hero. Ne needless to say, neither was Frankfurter. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I admire <laughs> Burton's integrity. Um, and uh, I admire the, the pure dedication to liberal constitutional thought of Wiley Rutledge. So uh, if I had a hero, it would be a composite. Mm -hmm. Burton's integrity, Rutledge's uh, dedication to liberal principles, Jackson's uh, <coughs> ability to write uh, unforgettable judicial opinions, Boy, if you could have combined those in one judge, you know, <laughs> that would have been super judge for me. In some virtual second edition, some hypothetical second edition, I keep records of things that I would like to, like to rewrite if I had the opportunity, or things that I didn't put in in the first place. Fortunately, the things that I missed were are pretty minor, but I still it annoys me. I'm a perfectionist and. It bothers me that they're not in the footnotes, at least. But some are substantive ideas, and by purest of coincidence, um, uh, the, uh, I assure anybody who's viewing this tape that uh, I did not put you up to this. This has just happened this way. One of these cards is, I'll just read the, the note to myself, Jackson and West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, um, RHJ, which is my way of referring to Jackson. I use, refer to all of them by their uh, initials. RHJ transmuted uh, free exercise into a speech issue here, which he did. I, I think that the Barnett case is really a religion clause case, and that was how it was originally seen. Today it's it treated exclusively as a speech case. Um, I said that this has had an unfortunate echo in the 1990s. Uh, the modern uh, religion cases that involve um, uh, are really establishment clause cases that are misunderstood as free exercise cases, like Lamb's Chapel and Rosenberg, and converted establishment clause issues into free speech and non-discrimination issues, which I think is really a, a misunderstanding of the of what's involved in those cases. But at any rate, I, you know, I wish I had an opportunity to rewrite the, 
the uh, stuff that I did in, in the free exercise chapter to carry the Im implications of Jackson's transmutation of, of uh, free exercise into free speech forward and, and to show how constitutional ideas often become wayward and wander into places that we don't expect that they'll go. I also wish well the next biographer of, of Jackson. Um, and what I hope that he or she would come up with is, among other things, in, in um, understanding the, uh, the significance of Jackson and his career and his place in our society, is how uh, is, is the trajectory of his development from such a, an un unpromising educational beginning to his growth in the federal offices in which he served, his, um, the distinction that he brought to the office of the Solicitor General, uh, his role as Attorney General and, and uh, FDR confidant, and how the, the, the challenge to, the, to Jackson's great biographer is going to be to tr trace and explain the course of development that resulted in 1941 with in producing a jurist of such extraordinary greatness and significance from you know, really pretty humble beginnings. And what was it in, in his experience, uh, his practice of law, mm -hmm. uh, where you practice, um, in that really very remote corner of New York State? What happened there that, that just as what happened to Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois, what, what pr produced men of such stature in uh, unlikely places? The, the book is a very intimate part of me and, uh, and always will be. Um, uh, Andrew Jackson insisted that he be buried clutching a copy of the Bible in his, in his cold, dead hand. I don't think I'll want to be buried that way, but uh, the book is still never, nevertheless a, a very important expression to me because it represents really the very best that I could do at the peak of my career. And it'll have to be judged on that basis. Um, but am I glad it's over? No, not really. Only in the sense that um, uh, it was invigorating and exhausting to have something <clears throat> that you could completely dedicate yourself to for six years, um, uh, to have that the focus of my life. I sort of miss that. Um, <clears throat> but on, on the other hand, I'm glad that I don't um, uh, that I don't have the constraints on what I do uh, dictated by writing a book of that size, and I'm free to go on to other things, and I'm happy to do so. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thanks so much.